Hey guys, this is Hard Time Strong Men with Nomad Fieldcraft. We're here to train up a better class of man and to make assets, not liabilities. Today we're having a little bit of a ruck rant. We're going to talk about uh, from the ground up, you're handing someone, brand new person, a rucksack, how they're going to set it up, different modifications they can do, and how to actually operate out of it. So Nomad, thanks for coming on, man. Excited to have you here. Yeah, thanks, dude. I'm really glad uh, we were able to make this work again in such a short time frame. I'm super pumped. I love rocks. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, it's whatever you do, if you operate in any capacity, you're going to have to bring equipment with you. So it makes sense to you know, have some experience under your belt, figure out uh, how to help dudes that don't know what's going on and uh, just you know, kind of get past that initial hump onto bigger, bigger things. So uh, the way I kind of set this up is, uh, like I said, starting from the ground up, uh, actually selecting, uh, choosing yep. a rucksack if you're, you know, obviously not issued one. Um, different modifications that we've seen and done to our to our rucksacks, our equipment to uh, help us use them better, and then just actual systems approach and operation, and then uh, you know, ongoing maintenance of your of your rucksack. We always say skills over gear, and that's entirely true. That's always been true. Um, but there comes a point to where you have equipment that cannot be serviced, uh, equipment that is kind of dead from, you know, from the start. So what would you say to guys who are looking to, uh, select their first rucksack, whether it be new or used, uh, what's your guidance for, for those guys? I think the very first thing people need to think about is, um, like mission dictates gear. What's the application? before we even talk about new or used, because obviously budget is a big thing for a lot of people. And um, this isn't a gatekeeping point, but if you're in the military or a professional capacity that you're going to use it professionally, then it makes sense to spend the money versus someone who just has the prepared mindset. Because like we said, there's such a wide array of things you're trying to focus on. And if you have a budget and a family, maybe pouring you know a mortgage payment into your very first piece of kit is not the smartest decision. So Right. I think the application is the very first thing. Like, okay, what are you using it for? In what context? Awesome. And, you know, that answers the the size question as well. Because, you know, you, yeah. you know as well as I do that new guys, if you, you know, give them a large, like a Alpine, like a you know, cross-country rucksack, they're going to try to stuff it full of brim and, you know, actually go yeah. and use it. They'll never be able to get anything out of it at night or, yeah. you know, <laughs> during a movement, anything. I just think the application, I guess, was like the first one. Yeah. Like, what are you using it for? So what would you say for guys that are, you know, looking for more like hunting or for uh, just travel? Or I guess what what would be some attributes that you would say just across the board that guys can look for in their, in their rucksack that uh, you would recommend? Um, without getting into, well, obviously we will talk about it. It's inevitable. We'll, we'll talk about brands, but um honestly it's the construction so again looking at like the new versus used if it's if it's made in china from wish.com probably don't buy it but you can get a used you know medium alice like we say and everyone's like oh these guys are like you know shrilling for medium alice i'm like no but they're pretty cheap and like i have a medium alice that i bought that was probably never used in service it looks brand new yeah and they're super cheap so i would say like the quality right away regardless if it's new or used um in the construction and again like without getting too nerdy in the textile sense because anyone who's getting into this may not be aware of the difference between like the different levels of cordura because everyone's like oh cordura is a whatever whatever textile material that's kind of a blend of other materials um and everyone's like oh it's military grade or military spec and there's 500 d cordura a thousand d so that's just the weight of the denier nylon that's what that means right that's how much it actually weighs so Again, based on your application, um, I wouldn't suggest the lightest rucksack if we're talking the overall prepared mindset, because from the other spectrum, the like through hikers or the really minimalist guys, they're going to get a bag that's super lightweight. But like, man, you drop it on like branches and there's a hole in it now. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. So regardless, new or used, regardless what brand, what Cordura, um, you yeah. Know, how flashy or not is how many, you know, Molly, what, how much Molly webbing has on it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What matters is, you know, if you're able to use it. Right. Yeah. So, 
uh, needs to be serviced. So checking all of your major failure points, the buckles, the straps, mm-hmm. where everything connects, especially with, you know, when you're talking about internal versus external frame. So seeing yeah. those stressor points, like on the alice you have where, um, where the top of the frame sits in. And I've seen a lot of wear in that area before, especially like the hip belt. Um, so just make sure that whatever you're choosing, like you said, whatever role, whatever uh, job you want the rucksack to help you do, it needs to be able to accomplish that. So uh, for dudes that are like looking for, like you said, through hiking, what am I trying to say, brother? So more of like a soldiering task, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to be busting through brush, you not going to want a ruck that has a lot of stuff that can, that's going to get caught on yeah. a brush. I know that when you were talking about donning or doffing, uh, talking about breaking every, you know, stick in your OP. Um, you see what I'm trying to say though? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, no, um, it's hard to, no, it's hard to articulate that, but it's hard to articulate. No. And that's why I think, man, the application is the big thing. It's like before anyone, because like I get a lot of questions about gear, even though I constantly say skills over gear, like we've been harping that, but anyone who looks at my Instagram or has heard me speak, they're like, this guy clearly likes gear, even though he's pushing to get away from gear being the solution. But um, yeah, whenever anyone asks, I'm like, okay, well, what's the actual intended application? Because like you said, if you're the through hiker, yes, you want, you want a thinner bag. You want it to be um, like as lightweight as possible with like the least amount of excess straps. And again, not to get caught up in the bush. You're just trying to cut weight. So I understand that. Right. But if you're doing this prepared mindset like we keep saying on your show to be you know the hard the hard man um in you know the shit hit the fan scenario i don't suggest you buy 10 bags you're probably going to want to buy one bag so mm-hmm. you're going to get the better bag in quality not even cost again it's is it more robust is the cordura better um are the straps maintained if you're if you're buying use if you're buying new okay is there like does this bag have a huge track record of certain like fall points in the i don't know the the harness system or the waist belt or where the load lifters are like what like all these little things right so like i said a lot of it can be answered to the individual on what's the application and it's not my opinion or your opinion or our experience i'm like well what are you using it for that's the very first question but people always when they go to buy a bag, they're like, I need it for this size. I'm like, well, what, like, what's the actual application? Are you just saying a size because a guy at a store told you that? Yeah. So I think, I think that's the very first thing is what's the application for the bag. Right. And I think what I did, you know, fumbling over all the different possibilities is exactly what guys do yeah. in the moment when they're trying to buy a ruck. Right. So right. it yeah. doesn't matter the, you know, 10th degree of you know options that you have will it fulfill the role that you need it to do. And something yes. that I mentioned in our last episode on rucks is, uh, I like to have dudes do their layout. So lay out everything on your poncho yes. that you want to fit in it, regardless of what bag you brought in or bags you brought in. You know, lay out everything that mm-hmm. you need, everything mission essential, everything for sustainment, survival, everything that you're going to carry in that ruck. And then if the ruck will fit it with, yeah. you know, what do we say? Like, you know, 25% more room or how much extra yeah, space so like- would, would, are you recommending? For me personally, like two thirds is, it's very drastic and like a lot of people can't fulfill that because they don't have the skills to go with less gear but i think if you had i'll just use a a volume as an example let's say you had a 50 liter bag that's the one you chose if you filled it to 40 so if you left the 10 percent capacity Mm -hmm. and then same thing if you had a 100 liter bag but you only filled it to like you know 20 percent from the top and again these percentages will vary on the size of the bag but i feel like that's a good way to do it because like you said if you lay out your kit before you make the selection on the bag, you're not going to buy a bag that's too small or on the other side, like we said, when you buy it too big, you'll find reasons to carry more stuff. It's just inevitable. People want to fill the space. Well, exactly. And you know, the mission, you know, mission dictates kit and the mission is always there, but the mission always changes. Right. So something that we talked about that we, you know, may get into today is when you're, you know, building these teams, building these squads, these organizations that are working together, uh, you're presented with a really great opportunity and a kind of a difficult challenge of how to uh, divvy out, you know, your team equipment, your squad equipment. Yeah. So, you know, you could have a guy that's totally squared away with his ruck, has it exactly how he needs it. But then you're like, oh, by the way, you're going to have to carry all of our building rich tools. Yeah. And then, you know, that kind of screws up his plan, right? So having that little bit of leeway to to um to fill that space if you need to but also not um not going overboard on that like you said yeah and then f- for that specific application that we're talking about if you are 
you know, in, in the military or not, you're just building your tribe, you're building your team. You, this is again, where our skills over gear, like you're going to carry less personal gear because you have to carry team stuff. Right. And that's something, again, people forget. And in my experience in the big green military, and I'm sure you guys saw it too, they just fill that or they think they fill or they think that they correct that problem by saying, we'll give you a bigger bag. I'm like, but that doesn't solve it. You're just letting guys carry more stuff now. Right. And right. when you have to, you know, meet the lowest common denominator, then you have situations where you're, you bring entire winter systems in the you know, yeah. heat of August and it makes no sense. But because, you know, some lowly private screws something up down the line, you know, now it's an SOP, you know, yes. which I really, um, you know, I was really interested to hear how you, you know, ran around in your unit with the smaller teams with guys that were more experienced. So you, know, yeah. you could cut down a lot of that, a lot of that nonsense. You know, you guys could get way more down to business, a lot more no nonsense. You know, that's really, yeah, that's really so, great. So one example that I can think of immediately, I know we're like jumping all over the place, but for that specifically for the team environment is because we were in a four man debt. We only brought two sleeping bags. Really? Not everyone brought a sleep system and we hot, we, the term was hot bagging it. So you shared bags, but you slept in your clothing. So you're not all greasy in someone else's bag, but we did that because you're we're in a, like a reconnaissance like role when you're doing OPs or LPs, or you're actually going to like, just, I don't know, survey the ground for a follow on force to do a raid or something. We're not all sleeping. We're probably at 50%. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why the other two guys are on security or they're taking notes and the other two guys can sleep. So that's why we didn't bring four sleeping systems. We brought two. That makes so so much sense. I didn't even think about it. So then we can thin out gear because we have to carry like, you know, surveillance equipment, radios, batteries, machine gun ammo, all that cool shit that everyone who was never in the army thinks is rad. I'm like, yeah, but it sucks being a four man team. And whenever, again, we were all the same rank, but as your junior on the team, like what you guys talked about in one of your previous podcasts, you were kind of just the lonely rifleman with an M203 because we didn't carried have the to, uh, you carried the most. I'm like, so now you're carrying the most gear, but that machine gunner. I'm like, yeah, I'm carrying the machine gun, like the light machine gun. And in Canada, it's the C9. It's your guys' uh, 249. It's the yeah. same thing. But um, I'm like, yeah, now I'm carrying belts and belts of ammo. So I'm probably not the guy carrying the sleep system. That rifleman is probably carrying the sleeping bag that we're going to share, as an example. Yeah. Smart, though. I mean, help me. I remember yeah. being uh, AG and carrying 600 rounds of 7.62. I mean, it's no it's no joke. No. <laughs> no, especially in that small unit like organization where the four of you, even though you are supporting, you know, a follow on force, you may be there for three or four days, not small, like mm -hmm. being supported. Right. So we, we would usually carry whatever the frontline ammo was. We would carry one and a half times. Wow. Yeah. Because there's four of us. So, yeah. And then again, plus, you know, radio batteries, surveillance equipment, um, you know, all that extra sh like defensive equipments too. And not even like defensive tools, but like, you know, a couple of claymores cause there's four of us. Wow. Probably bringing two claymores. <laughs> yeah. Well, like you said, having to be able to act independently, you know, from the, yes. from the main force, that's huge. Yeah. And then again, by eliminating your quote unquote civil gear or your nice to have, or people are like, well, you'll die without it. I'm like, well, no, there's four of us and two of us are sleeping. And guess what? If like a storm comes in and we are legitimately going to die, we're going to like go into survival mode at this point. Yeah. And because the four of us have skills, then it doesn't really matter at that point. Right. So back to the, back to the rucks. So, um, what are some modifications that you've, that you've done to your kit over time or things that worked for you that, um, you know, that you think people could pass on and, and have good benefit from. So anytime I get a bag, um, again, cause I am like a big bag lady and I have a bunch of rucks, I'll like cut all the excess straps off, like anything extra yes. and not even, so I'm not talking the side retention straps, because again, if you had to, if you had to strap team equipment, defensive equipment, whatever. But I mean, the excess tail on the strap, I'll cut it to what I think is an acceptable length. Yeah. Instead of me having it totally coiled up perfectly for like a garrison inspection, I'm like, I don't need that. I'm going to cut it. Right. I'm so I'm trying to tape it or chalk yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, no, I'm just going to, I'm going to cut it off. Um, I've done this even on my issued rock and they didn't really like it when I turned it back in, but I did it. I cut off Molly that I didn't need. Yes, I was gonna say that is I heavy. It. Once it gets it's a heavy certain... and it snags on stuff. Yeah, and people don't like that. They're like, "Well, now his m ruck isn't matching Molly." I'm like, "Well, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. I'm cutting it." Well, and that's the thing. If you're not using it, yeah, why, why I have it? it? Well, it's like having all yes. that you know extra foot, foot and half of you know webbing just in case you need to be able to extend your strap that far. It makes absolutely no sense. So yeah, get rid of it. So yeah, I would. 
I would cut that stuff off. Um, I reviewed any, like, I don't want to say weak points, but, like, points that are most likely to get damaged. So, like, again, we'll use the Alice as the example. You said that sleeve where the frame fits into. Here, because I have an Alice right here. So, yeah, where that sleeve fits in on, the on like, the two corners there on a used bag or the frame will rub, right, right. on that part of the bag. Right. So mm -hmm. I'll, like, inspect that first. And I may, like, burn it if I have to. Or, you know, I'll even cover it in shoe goo where the threads are exposed or whatever I have to do before I even use the bag. I'm trying to find the weak points and I'm going to reinforce it as best I can. Yeah. Not specifically rucks, but any, any kind of issue equipment that I had that had, you know, that was metal that would be rubbing on something that yeah. I didn't absolutely need to, you know, leave alone. I would actually take sports wrap like Coban, like yes. you know, the stretchy yeah. tape. And I would, yeah. you know, it was black, so it didn't reflect it. You know, it wasn't Smart. anything off the norm, but I would just wrap it. And that one, if it was, you know, rubbing against fabric, it would stop it from rubbing you know, that friction mm -hmm. would keep it there. And also it would cut down wear and tear. Yeah. But I think my and then, favorite, and, go for it. And then, yeah, it's probably, make, it's probably getting rid of the noise as well because you're not having metal on yes. whatever. Yes, yeah. exactly. Also smart. That's another thing is, you know, taking like old socks on, you know, metal on metal where you get that clanking. So yeah. and like, a barrier. Yeah and, yeah, and then put in a sock over like a water bottle as an example because like I made a post about that. I'm like, we did that. Like we just, I put my, even even before I could carry an Nalgene and it was cool and like you had to use the issued canteen with a cup, I just yeah. put it over a sock so it doesn't make any noise. I was going to say that's what I did with my canteen cup because I would always keep my nods in my canteen cup to to protect them. I yeah. Just did yeah. that day one. Yeah. I think something that, my favorite thing I did when I was in was I would take the, um, you know, whatever store brand, like I used Kiwi, the uh, waterproofing spray. Yeah. And I'd spray over everything that'd be like everything. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. And it wasn't perfect, but it would definitely help to beat off any, you know, excess moisture if it rained or whatever. If you, if I wasn't able to use a pack cover, then, you know, it's better than one getting all your stuff wet that's inside, but also too, all that webbing, all that fabric gets so, so waterlogged, so heavy. So heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Miserable. And that's exactly why, like I said, I'd cut excess straps. I'd cut the webbing. Um, and if I didn't cut it, I would tape it to whatever length is like the most applicable. Right. So again, um, sometimes, well, most of the time we would rock without armor and like we carried armor in and we'd put it on if we had to, and we just rocked like, you know, field shirt or whatever. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I would adjust the rock to match my body without armor. Right. Or again, if you have to wear armor, then adjust your rock to match your body with armor. So you're not constantly, when you're donning and doffing, you're like, I need to adjust it constantly. Right. So. Awesome. So, uh, in and out of the military, do you ever use your ruck in conjunction with other equipment? I know that we talked about, um, when you were with static, you know, on this last hunt, you used his, uh, his kit bag, right? He let you yeah. borrow that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, from, I guess, almost like an approach for the rucking thing. Um, again because everyone anyone listening to this like they're pretty familiar with like the whole gear thing and like the first line second line third line right did you right. guys use that terminology in the u.s army as well we did yeah similar? no one ever okay, gave us yeah. class on it, of course but yeah we used it oh okay you guys used it like like kind of synonymously like so third line was implied as your ruck right like, that's your sustainment stuff yeah. yeah so um yeah i just find that like again me personally I don't want to carry a 90 pound ruck. I'd probably rather have a 55 pound ruck, but then carry like a spreader on my body, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know I mean, including everything. So yeah. like first line, second line. Whereas again, it's a different approach. Some people are like, I'll put everything on my ruck. I'm like, it's, it's really uncomfortable. You get tired. Your weight kind of gets shifted right. uh, or in a tactical sense, you're trying to, oh, I need this item. I got to take my ruck off. But if you have, again, like the Hill People Gear kit bag or um, I'm using an old bino harness. Well, it's not old. I just, I use, I repurposed it, but I'm using a bino harness for the same like line one. I put kind of yeah. the survival stuff in there. Or, you know, if you're out uh, on longer patrols or movements, I'll literally have like snacks, like lickies and chewies in there so I can get to it while I'm walking kind of thing. Awesome. Yeah. I got a kid bag in. I love that thing. Especially which one do you have? Do you know which, I which the, size? Yeah, I have, I think it's like the original. It's the, it's the largest one. Okay. Like nice. the original V2, something like that. But nice. I yeah. love that thing. I've not even probably filled it halfway and it's, you know, it has everything I need in it already. I mean, so I carry my Glock 17 in there. So a full size handgun, yep. spare magazine. I have my little fire kit. I have all my land nav stuff. So maps, notebook, 
protractor compass. I have a Garmin Fortrex in there. I've got my gloves. I have multi-tool. Uh, yeah. You know, all my pens, my ferro rod, everything. Because I use that more as, you know, like, so the line, so my first line. So um, yeah. re- whether I'm, anytime I'm outdoors, I have it. So if I'm hiking, uh, hunting, you know, doing movement, like, you know, actually doing, you know, cool guy stuff, um, it never leaves my body. So whether yeah. I have an assault pack or a ruck, it's always on. So um, the only time I ever take it off is to, you know, if I'm going to be in one spot for a extended period of time or if I'm sleeping and it's my pillow. So yeah, it's always there smart. as everything that I always need. And, you know, just the, I love its design with, um, you know, the guys that help people gear, they actually go out and they use their stuff. So they're outdoorsmen. They know what mm-hmm. they're doing and they've designed it to where it sits in between the shoulder straps on whatever you yeah. have. So it doesn't matter what bag you use, you can always use the kit bag. So I've, I've really appreciated that. It's been honestly my favorite piece of kit so far. Yeah. And I definitely think it's under, it's underappreciated or underused to supplement the rucksack because again, I I understand the purpose of the first line and there's going to be people who disagree and they're like, well, the first line should be on your body. But if you are layering at all, and again, not, not to harp on the winter thing, Mm -hmm. because I get there's people who don't live in a winter environment, but even if you're not in a winter environment and you have in your pockets on your body when you need to change because your clothing got trashed or you fell in the water or whatever the scenario is now you're trying to cross load crap within your first line which again i've done before i'm sure you've done tons of people have done it before but to have it in a very small mini quote-unquote chest rig system whatever brand you use Mm -hmm. is super intelligent because like you said you can just constantly take it on take it off and even with static and i i literally wore it all day like the whole time i I only took it off to sleep that was it i had it on me the entire day didn't matter if I layered up, layered down. I would just put a jacket over it and zip it up partially yeah. instead of taking it off. Like I just kept it against my body. Yeah. No, yeah. it's great. It was yeah. super intelligent. And then again, to have things in a nice, neat spot to supplement your ruck, I think, or your three lines, arguably not even just a rucksack, I think makes sense. Because like I said, and anyone who's rucked, not even professionally, even if you like hike and you're like, you hike with your family or whatever, I don't like it in my pant leg pocket while I walk. It I either rubs it. or chafes. Or I'm going to lose it. Even if it's tied off, I hate it against my leg. I don't like that. I've never been able to do it. So cargo pockets, I've never been able to use them ever because it just yeah. chafes the outside of my leg. It chafes. And yeah. Yeah. It's horrible. So. Yeah. And the only thing I've ever put in cargo pockets, <clears throat> even now on some of um, on some of the hiking pants I do wear now that I'm not in uniform, I'll put my gloves. So contrary to you with the Hill People Gear, uh, Hill People Gear kit bag where you said you have your gloves, because I talked about it in our layering episode on our show. Um, I put right glove, right cargo pocket, left glove, left cargo pocket. So even if I'm super messed up and exhausted, I know my right gloves, my right pocket, left gloves, and left pocket. And gloves are a thing that I've never chafed when I've walked. But I mean, like a ferro rod does a map again in the military, terrible in a cargo pocket. I hated having a map in my pocket with like your compass, your protractor, all that. And I've even seen guys rip a cargo pocket on a long infill and they lost their entire nav package because it was in the right pant leg pocket. So I think the help people gear kit bag or something like that is a good, it's a good supplement to make your rucksack a lot better of a system. Yeah, for sure. And for dudes that use belt kit. Yeah. You know, so I've 100%. got my, so I've got the kit bag and then I also have a Nixie Warriors Life Fire Rig, which is kind of a mix of, you know, having a larger butt pack, but also having, you know, all that molly webbing on the side where you can have all your fighting load and everything else. But I use those in conjunction together. And if I, yeah. you know, I'm going to have a longer, uh, longer outing, I have, you know, I supplement that with an assault pack or a ruck and, you know, off you go. You have everything you need all the time. And like I said, you yeah. know, even if I'm going to, you know, doff the, you know, doff my uh, belt kit, the kit bag always stays on. So yeah, it's, it's worked really great using that systems uh, approach. I've been very pleased with that. And, uh, you know, my counterpart six, he was always very, you know, he, originally was um skeptical but then he was amazed by he was know. sold immediately oh yeah. yeah i mean well functionally so not per item count but functionally i carry the same yeah. amount of equipment that he did in his ruck you know which is a yeah. huge mr ranch you know bag yeah. that he filled to the brim and functionally i carried the same amount of stuff that he did just in that belt kit and my kit bag so yeah a lot of it has yeah, to you just do had with, it spread out yeah, yeah well a lot of it is you know, trying to make your equipment go farther than uh, it is at face value. So anything that I have in my in my kit, I want to serve two or three purposes. If I can't do that, then I want to be small. And mm-hmm. 
you know, just trying to trying to take that mentality, which a lot different from when I was in, uh, has really changed just how I how I look at kit and how I look at um, uh, you know, just looking at packing list, uh, you know, at face value, uh, what I can do and how far I can how far I can push it. Yeah, and like I just think the whole load everything you own into your ruck and just not carry anything else on you is like again, it's from a physiological standpoint, it's terrible to carry that much weight. It doesn't matter if you're like, I can do a hundred pounds. I'll make everyone can who's done it. It's just not good long term. Oh yeah. And then uh like, you know, from a realistic tactical scenario, what if you lose your ruck? You have nothing on you now. Right. But like we said, if you have that uh you know, help people get your kit bag or an, or an equivalent of it on your body. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, I don't need to rifle through my rucksack at one in the morning to find my fire bag because it's in that chest rig. Right. Well, I appreciate what you said, how, you know, about your gloves. doesn't matter how screwed up you are. It doesn't matter how, you know, I know what where they are. are they, yeah. You know where they are yeah. <laughs> because you, you carved that out. Like, yeah, that is your like right glove, right pocket, left glove, left pocket. And I do the same thing for my winter layers with, with my coat. Yeah. I have bigger mitts. I've got big outdoor research, like huge, like, they look like snowmobile gloves, but they're not. They're I don't know the, the model, but they're big outdoor research right. ones. And I have them in right glove, right pocket, left glove, left pocket. So it's it's just like the SOP for me. Every piece of garment. I'm like, okay, I have gloves in each pocket. Yeah. I mean, you carved that out through experience. You know, yeah, you instead actually of getting me out putting and doing it in stuff. a kit bag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you getting out and doing stuff, you know, that carved that out and it works for you. And you'll never forget yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. And then let's talk about operations. So actually, you know, working out of living out of your living out of your ruck. So something that I didn't really touch on in our last episode was actually packing your ruck. Yeah. So what's your wisdom there? So, um, obviously you want your heaviest items against, um, like against your back. So I guess we kind of skipped it, but like internal frame or external, regardless of what ruck right. you're choosing, mm-hmm. you kind of want the weight, the heaviest, you can get against your actual body um and again i'll use i'll use any military rucksack as a kind of a baseline because anyone knows like that's again it doesn't matter the country doesn't matter the origin a military style rucksack usually they have an internal quote-unquote radio pouch so picture like that that's where people would want to put the heaviest items but again people are like well I'll put my camel back there because it's the safest i'm like ah like i would put your heaviest items there and your camel back or your bladder is probably going to explode like you know yep. what i mean like i've used the bladder too I, I still see the need for it sometimes, but I'm not going to put that there. So that's essentially where you want to put the heaviest stuff. And then your least likely things to use, i.e. your sleep system, is probably going to go at the bottom. You're right. not going to use that at the top because you're not going to rack out right away. Even in a not military, not tactical context, you're going hiking with your family for, you know, three, four days. You're sleeping at night. So that could probably go on the bottom. Um, and then, yeah, there there's a not an argument, but... People are very obsessed with you put your most used items up top, and I don't disagree with that. But I would agree. I would argue more that again, your heavier items make more sense to have it higher in your rucksack up top of your shoulder blades or between your shoulder blades. Sorry. Um, and I'm thinking food because I've seen so many people, man, pack food at the bottom because they're like, "Well, I'm gonna eat later." I'm like, "But now you have all that weight hanging off your back. It's too far off against your body." Well, then, whenever you have a limited time to eat, you have to go all the way. To you got to go your through rock. your whole bag. Exactly. So I actually put my food in last and my water at the very top. Yeah. I, that's the last thing I do. And then I kind of just pack everything around that. But um, I know we were talking about, uh, again, I'm not remembering all, all the terms because there's so many gear things, but like those dry bags, those roll bags or compression sacks, whatever yeah, yeah. you want to call them. Right. Um, I used to compress my sleeping bag in the compression sack. I did. I did for a long time in the military. And then someone wiser than me at some point said, like, you have this wasted space in your ruck in the bottom where your sleeping bag is where you can't fit another compression bag because they're like weird, you know, cylindrical shapes and your rucks are right. a rectangle. So it's not fitting. You have like voided space. So I kind of got away from those. <coughs> Excuse me, completely. Um, again, other than I put my food in a separate bag. That's just how I do it. So I can grab all the food out and kind of eat from there. But um, yeah, I do the contractor bag thing we had talked about. So I, I yeah. just take the biggest, the biggest, most heaviest duty uh, garbage bag. They just call them contractor bags, but it's a black garbage bag. And I throw it in my rucksack. And then even if the ruck has a split design. So again, all the military bags are a ha- or an Alpine European tall rucksack, internal framed. Um, I, I like eliminate the divider. I'll unzip it or open it so I can just put my sleeping stuff and then pack all my 
it on top. Right. I don't want it to be like these guys are like, well, I can unzip it and get my sleeping bag out. I'm like, but now you can't repack it the way you did in your apartment or your house before you got to the field. Right. So I just shove everything in the bottom. I use a contractor bag. And then, like I said, I put all my heavier items at the top. You kind of want it right against your back. Um, yeah. And then just to repeat the end, I keep water and food accessible at the very top. And the camelback thing at the top makes sense. Not just because it's less likely to explode, but I can fill it now and not empty my bag. Yeah. Smart. Because again, people who put it in that radio pouch, which we've seen everyone does it in the army. Mm. I'm like, well, now you got to empty out all your to get your bladder. All right. And, and what we did, it was just our SOP for guys that did do bladders because your buddy could refill it or get to your water. We carried it underneath our ruck lid strapped down. Oh, I've seen that before. Yeah. It was on top. That's how we all carried it. If we had a bladder. Yeah. So I could see it from you and I could refill it if I had to, or I could grab it or whatever. Yeah. I've seen that done before. That's just how we did it. Yeah. And then as well to have it outside of the bag, if it does explode, even though my ruck is waterproofed, it's not trashing my food or anything or mission essential gear. It's totally outside my bag. And, now you just have water on the outside of your ruck. Yeah, I was gonna say with guys putting it in that radio pouch, it's not even that you know it's on the top of your ruck and just drained down. It is the full thickness. The everything. full thing. Yeah, everything you own is soaked. And I, dude, I would love seeing guys. They'd put it in their contractor bag or their waterproof bag. I'm like, dude, that should literally be completely separate. I don't know who's telling you this, but I'm like, what you're doing is wrong. <laughs> well, I made this. I made the mistake of putting uh, like soiled clothes, like. Going okay. through across yeah. in a contractor yeah. bag, and then you know I never use them again for that field problem. But then I got back to yeah. you know I got back to my barracks room. Where I was emptying everything out. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't I didn't think that far ahead. I didn't think of it. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly right. And these and these are just little things that like you know like like we keep harping on. It's experience based, mm-hmm. and like you know by us sharing this information, it's not like we're not trying to dictate like do this or you know you're retarded or do this you're gonna die i'm like well no we're doing this because like i've done it wrong for years and i did it right for years so yeah. maybe this might work for you and the, the like the camelback or water bladder thing is a big one where it really bothers me when i see people put it inside the ruck like it actually like makes me anxious to think that like they're gonna get all their shit wet. well it's such a it's such a weak point when you think about yeah it. and so, like you know the pros versus cons it doesn't make any sense to to do no. that but again, people are thinking it from like, oh, I'm filling a space and it's the shape of the radio pouch. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense, man. Yeah. Like where you're putting it because it's going to explode. And again, um, um, I wasn't mechanized, but like um, I have been in a vehicle before in the military and they just throw your rucks and nobody gives a shit. So I'm like, now your camelback is exploding. Whereas if mine's up the top strapped, if it does explode, it's not in my bag. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't every really time they throw care. off, it's like 10 feet off the ground too, so yeah Good exactly that. so i'm like i yeah like i don't really care at that point and then again for the context of not in the military you're just packing your normal bag now for your prepared mindset um having that weight high up with the bladder makes sense mm-hmm. it's like on my it's I, it's actually above my shoulders right because yeah. of where the lid is yeah. right well so and makes that's, sense to have you know that's just biomechanics man i mean that's just yeah. how your body is designed to bear weight you know yeah. with your center of gravity and everything else so yeah it's you know just seeing guys like pack all their heavy shit on the bottom or you know far away from their body just the the torque on your back is just it, it's horrible <laughs> or like to see the weight shift in their ruck because their ruck is not tied well yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. like you'll be out with some people and like they thought they had x item up top and then they open the ruck and it's like literally by their sleeping bag i'm like because you didn't pack it properly yeah so now it's shifted or or you're that guy you're walking and it's shifting like that's terrible Oh, yeah. Terrible feeling yeah. Watch, watching it move around. So mm-hmm. I think, yeah, like really locking down how to pack your ruck. And um, honestly, the contractor bag is an easy thing. It waterproofs all your shit. And um, it's hard to explain, like not visually, but yeah, to close it off, we just like we would tie it really tight and we called it goosenecking because mm-hmm. it made it really tight. It looks like a gooseneck. It's super skinny. Yeah. And then you just bend it at 90 degrees left or right. Yeah, just lift it over would, right. And then yeah, yeah. yeah, you just lift it over itself. So it's got a bite. It mm-hmm. essentially has a bite. And then you take your retainer slash ranger bands, depending on what your unit calls them, <laughs> and you just retain or ranger band the top. Yeah. And then it's waterproof. That's yeah. it. Awesome. I think the only thing that I um you know yeah. that I really heard from the... you on that is the uh what I call it compartmentalizing. So um yeah. using either those stuff sacks or I used most of the time uh just like the gallon freezer ziploc bags yeah and i didn't 
I, I see the pros and cons there with having everything be compartmentalized. That doesn't make any sense. But my yeah. little stuff, so if I had extra batteries, you know, like undergarments, things of that nature, where yes. I want to be able to, you know, to be able to pick out a bag day by day or like food, you know, like food rations. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like doing that. And if, you know, my ruck got wet on the inside, then I wouldn't have to, wouldn't have to worry about those things. But um, something I was going to say when, you know, you're talking about, you know, packing your ruck properly and stitching everything down. What that also does besides, you know, not laying the weight shift around is it silences your ruck, you 100%, know, which is, which yeah. is huge. Yeah. And then it's also preventing again, like stuff from dangling and then you get caught again in the, in the bush, right? Like you're walking or it'll rip or like it snags or like you, you like, I hated seeing that man. Like guys, um, guys like, horizontal stabilizer strap i think is the actual term like on the side of the rock that you're just strapping it down yeah they wouldn't have it clipped and i'm walking at night and it like hits me in the face yeah from this guy's rock in front of me i'm like yeah because he's an idiot doesn't have his rock tied down yeah this is like very simple things that again like even even the most non-tactical granola eating through hiker has a prob- properly cinched down rock sack because yeah. they understand body mechanics and they understand how to conduct movement well and the thing that i hate when people you know, hate on like through hikers or airsofters or professional hunters, you know, yeah. guys that, you know, aren't in, you know, in quote unquote the community. Right. But you're talking about experts, yes. experts in their craft. So I'd much rather talk to a through hiker about, about rucksacks than, yeah. you know, some, you know, soft or seal dude that I found off the street because, you know, they're crawling out of every crevice, but <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just, it's, you know, find, you know, your subject matter experts find the guys that know what they're doing and, and emulate that, you know? Yeah. And it, and it's funny because like rucks, rucks specifically, like we keep saying for like, you know, not to go full circle, just to beat on field craft, but like rucks are applied to every industry. And again, it doesn't have to be a rucksack. It could be a, like a quote unquote day bag. Yeah. Like, like you're bringing your bag for the day with your family and your kids. And instead of you having a stupid dad diaper bag that's slinged across your body, you have a day bag with, yeah, you probably have diapers in there and like food and snacks and stuff for your family, but it's how you packed it. Right. Yeah. It's still like, you can still apply these principles to whatever application you're using. And I feel like rucksacks is a good like conversation for anyone because everyone knows what it's like to carry a bag. Like man, like people have been doing it since they were little kids going to school. You carry a backpack. Yeah. Well, and you know, time about, <laughs> you know, way back hard times, you know, uh, trapsmen. Yeah, exactly. Right? Guys who were living out of that for, you know, talk about Months, extended periods years, of time. Like, it's yeah, crazy. Extended periods. Yeah. yeah. And those guys had like super like generic basket weaved bags. And they yeah. did it. But skills over gear, they knew what they were doing yeah. and they made exactly. it work. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Whereas now, like we said, this whole, um the whole the whole rucksack game like and again obviously you and i are passionate about bags and we like bags but man you could google like military rucksack and there's probably 200 brands you know what i mean yeah. everyone's making a bag now mm-hmm. so like where do you go where do you start but like i said it's if you can just kind of follow these you know end user quote-unquote operations on how to pack a ruck how to don a ruck how to doff a ruck um what you, what it's being applied for like it doesn't really matter on the brand of bag at the end of the day yeah there are more comfortable bags 100 percent there are yeah. There's lighter bags, there's more robust bags, like art of course there's gonna be, but I think if you can apply these principles to any bag, it doesn't really matter if I have a forty dollar, you know, surplus bag versus the latest and greatest from, you know, whatever brand that's two thousand dollars. I'm like, well, I know how to apply these skills. Yeah, exactly. Uh so talk about dying and doffing. So I know yes, I'm wrong. I, <laughs> do you wanna do you wanna talk about why yeah. I'm wrong? No, I was gonna say do you First off, we'll we'll make it more interesting. Do you want to explain how you put on a rucksack? <laughs> how I put on a rucksack. So because you do it I, the same way ninety percent of people do it. Yeah, I know I'm wrong. It's how I learned. <laughs> and that's not an excuse, but what I do is I take my injury waiting to happen and I put it on the ground. <laughs> I step behind it. My injury waiting to happen. I I reach over my huge backpack. I grab the frame and then I violently hoist it over my body. I fit my arms through the straps and then I let fall. Perfect. Really hard. That's the best. And then I clip in. (laughs) On your your her body. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's a great plan every time. So 
why do you think people do that just because again we'll I, go to the military context because someone was screaming I, at you to put it on but is that why and that's my thing so that's not like no like, where did this come from outside of the military <laughs> no one has ever put on a backpack like that so who <laughs> right though like have, yeah, have you ever seen no, anyone do that no so no who came up yeah. with it i don't know the point so and that's my thing so as a medical professional i'm a nurse right uh so yeah. as a medical professional that's horrible biomechanics <laughs> Don't, yeah. don't do it. If you're doing it, stop. Right. But also you're just, so you're flipping your ruck for no reason. The one, the ruck that you just packed for no reason. Yeah. Right. All your mission essentially get, you're just throwing it around just, just for fun, I guess. And then, you know, for one, it makes no sense for the space. You know, if you're in a confined space, you can't don a ruck or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but you're just inviting injury and it's not, it's not quicker. It's not more efficient. No. I don't, I don't understand. So how, no. how did you learn and how do you don your ruck? Um, I was going to say, before I say that, I'm actually going to explain the other one. Cause I actually thought you were going to say you did it this way, but it's, I think this is the more common way. So I'll like, again, no one's watching. We're just talking, but mm -hmm. um, when you grab the bag, I think most people will loosen one side. So oh. whatever side you are, oh, then you throw it. And you throw it. So I think that's like the other people just kind of put an arm in and then try and fish their other arm in, hook it through. They'll do the old bend over at the waist, looking at the ground and then cinch up the bag. And then they're like, my bag's on. And I didn't throw it over my head. Right. Um, I think that's the most normal way. Well, quote unquote, normal way or most common way people do it. But it's also wrong. Again, like from a body mechanic standpoint, if you're slinging the bag around on one, one arm, you could pull your back. You could get your arm stuck trying to fish it in. Again, I know people who are like, well, I don't have kit on. Okay, but if you have kit on, you're going to get caught. Like, I've seen it. I've seen it with a sling. I've seen it with, like, their radio antenna. All this crap. They can't get their bag on. Um, but, yeah, doing the overhead thing, I don't know, like, either, sorry, where that started, why people do it. It's like they do a weird squat, and they hold it over their head, and they shove their arms through. And then it's, like, loud, lands on their back, whatever. So, yeah, the way I was formally taught, or, sorry, the way I was formally taught how to do it, by a much more professional soldier than than me was we sat our bag down on its like bottom and we just loosened the straps again as much as we had to to get our arms in we sat down into the bag put your arms into both positions from the seated position while you're still sitting in the bag we would lean back and kind of rock onto the back of the bag so you could tighten the actual straps if you chose to use a chest strap i suggest you do we would adjust it from that position while you're kind of rolled on your back like a turtle. And then we wouldn't roll over to our front. We would kind of roll over to our side so that you could shoot um, one leg out in front of you. So you're essentially in a kneeling position, which is a firing position, a super stable platform. And then from there, you could stand up into your ruck. Yeah. So it's safer because you're just sitting into the ruck. Um, you're also not throwing it over your head. And like we said, from a tactical standpoint, you're, and like, I've had this happen to me all the time. People hit me in the face with the bag because they're in front of me. They hit debris. And again, you're in, you know, a layup position or a release point. And now your entire patrol is making noise because you're all doing it this way. It falls on your back, you get injured or it gets caught or whatever. But if you all sit into your bag and do it one at a time, again, from a tactical standpoint, I can cover you while you do it. Like we can stop and halt and I can say seven, put your bag on. I'll cover you. And I'm literally sitting on my bag while you sit into yours, adjust it, get to your kneeling position, then stand up. And then you say, okay, I'm covering you now. And then I do the exact same thing. And like you said, it's no slower. I will argue with anybody. It's not slower. Yeah. It's extremely safe. And we're actually covering each other the whole time. Yeah. Instead of every person throwing it over their head, no one's getting injured. You're not. Oh, also by doing it this way, if you have any additional kit strapped to the side of your rucksack, mm -hmm. you're not losing it like a yard sale when yeah. you throw it over your body. <laughs> yeah so yeah it was shown to me very early on in my military career like i was a like literally nothing e1 on a course and this dude looked at us and said you guys are i know you're gonna bleep it but he's like you guys are fucking retarded you're gonna kill yourselves putting your rucksacks on that way this is how professionals do it and dude it literally stuck in my mind as an e1 and as i worked up the ranks every guy below me i'm like dude you're not putting your rock on that way i'm like that's retarded we're not gonna do it that way this makes way more sense yeah and, and even at home too, man, like again, not in the field, if I'm grabbing a bag or like, 
or, or I'll use the field as an example, there's like a bench. I'll put the bag on the bench to sit into it or stand into it. I, even with a day bag, I don't throw it over my head because it's just muscle memory. Yeah. I've done it so many times now of sitting into it because again, my argument with people is, okay, well, if you slack once now you're going to do it, you're going to default to the way you've done it a million times. Yeah. Which is the overhead throw or the, you know, over the shoulder sling or whatever. Right. Well, I was going to say, I've done that before with vehicles where I've, you know, set up on, sat it on the vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Went behind exactly. it, strapped on yeah. and off you go. Exactly. Which is no different than the sit-in method, but you're doing it in a, you know, light infantry capacity or whatever, a patrolling capacity for argument's sake. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, so that's donning, I guess. And then doffing, taking it off is literally the exact kind of opposite um we wouldn't sit down all the time like i just wouldn't but sometimes what we would do is i i might be from a kneeling position and i would just loosen up one strap completely and then uh take out my other arm and lower it under control but i'm not like hitting the quick release buckles on the thing or flicking your arms off or um the best two would see you guys again in the military context you're standing there and they just like hit the fast x buckles and it falls and like the guy's six feet tall it falls on the ground makes so much noise yard sale all his stuff and then now he's got to reclip it because he's like, I need it off. And like, you can, I'm covering you. Like I'm literally covering you with a gun. You can take one second right. and take it off properly yeah. and put it down. And then you can sit your ruck um, down. The other thing too, for do like doffing, like taking it off or whatever. Um, we would always sit our rucks whenever I put my bag down, even now out of uniform, I put it down. So my shoulder straps are facing the ground because if I don't have a ruck cover when it's raining, the part against my back is not getting soaked. Yeah. Smart. And that's how I got everyone to do it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter your rank, your position. I'm like, you're all taking off your rock that exact way. And it makes you're sense. You're going to sit on it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense, right? <laughs> uh, Instead can you talk of about everyone that? having rocks. Can you talk about sitting, sitting on, on it? it? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, um, again, in like the military context or, you know, your minute manning or whatever, when you take your ruck off, we would sit on it for a long halt. For a short halt, we would actually just again, go to your, like, go to like your kneeling position, your firing position. And then you would sit down on like the same way that you would don it on the like turtle position. So you're kind of seated on your butt with your feet flat on the ground because the seated position is the second most stable firing position behind the prone. So I don't know why people would think I'm going to take a knee with a hundred pound ruck. Because again, this same dude that showed me how to put it on when guys were taking a knee, man, he was walking by, kicking them over and laughing and calling them retards and watching them on the and ground. They, and they turtle because they have no they balance. They turtle and they can't get up. And then, or like they'd get a rifle butt in the face or their sling is all caught. And then that's whenever he straight up said, are you guys not familiar with the different firing positions? And everyone's like, well, yeah, we know them. He's like, seated position is the second most stable platform. Why would you just not take a seat? And again, light bulb came on. And then for long halts, it became... SOP on this specific course I was on to later on again in my career where I was able to influence change a bit. I told guys, I'm like, okay, we're going to do a long halt. You're literally going to take off the rucksack like the way I taught you to, and we're going to sit on it. And how we would sit on it would be the same thing. We'd sit on it with the shoulder straps because we're like just halted. Even if it's raining, it was reversed for this one. Your shoulder straps would be up. So if we had to move, I could sit into the rucksack from that position instead of me trying to flip it over. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And that's just... And that's just the way we did it. And again, people thought I was like being super anal with my, my ruck OCD, but I'm like, no, dude, this actually makes sense. And it's super applicable to everything we're doing. Yeah. I mean, and I wanted to talk to have you talk about that because, you know, the U S army completely forgot that sitting was a firing position. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, that was, I'm pretty sure the Canadian forces forgot too until this, until this bro told me in 2007 and he called us retards and I'm like, Oh, sweet. Yeah. Like we could sit in a rucksack. That's, totally makes sense but i love how i love how you like said that he told y'all right he's like hey that's retarded you know this is how yeah. professionals do it yeah like, dude and that was the way the he right said it he way. literally said this is how professionals do this yeah and right away it made me feel like wow i'm not a professional i'm a f amateur all right like so this guy's it, calling me out so introduce a challenge <laughs> and introduce yeah. a standard right yeah. so i mean so cool and then i also like what you said about um was it short haul or long haul where you uh, lay your ruck with the straps down? Okay, so so we would only lay it for the straps down, sorry, if we were actually going to be like in a patrol base or defensive position or, or like your patrol is actually completely stopped. But cool. for short halt, you would sit with it 
in the turtle position so it's still right, on your back right. like yeah, you're yeah. still wearing the rucksack and you're seated back with your feet flat so you're in a seat, like seated position and then a long haul you would actually you know doff the ruck or take it off like a normal human put it down on the ground sit on it but the shoulder straps are up in this position because if we got bumped you could sit into it from that position. makes sense yeah and that's how we did it yeah yeah sorry just my mind when i thought of um no, you know, okay. putting your ruck down for an extended time right yeah and military hunting you know whatever context your you know camouflage should be on the outside of the outside of the ruck so you put it down with the camouflage facing out it just exactly. makes more yeah. sense right or if you it makes more sense yeah or if you yeah. like uh so on scrim or you know whatever on yeah. your ruck i mean just it makes more sense it makes more sense to keep it camped and the other way we did it too like i said if you were actually caching your rucks or you're in a patrol base doing army things now um and it's pouring rain my shoulder straps and waist belt aren't getting soaked awesome. it's the top of my ruck that is yeah yeah cool same dude same guy told me and same thing he very politely said you guys are retarded in the patrol base and we corrected the retardation of how to put on a rucksack i love guys like that i had a yeah i didn't see he was one of my favorites and he i don't remember what was messing up but he just looked at me and it just he had he had pain in his eyes and he said why why are you doing that and i just stopped for half seconds like oh because <laughs> i'm an idiot he's like yeah yeah you are and you know you see, just you need people like that who'll just you need people like that just you know kind yeah. of snap you out of you know whatever bad habits you had and i don't even understand though where it came from because like i was already in the army for over a year by this point like i got in like mid 06 and this was end 07 so like i was yeah i'm a fucking new guy but i like like i'm not fresh off basic you know what i mean mm -hmm. so like where did i learn to throw a rock sack over my head like the way you described like who showed me that because it's wrong exactly yeah I'm, and this guy corrected it immediately. And then, like I said, from there forward, I'm like, okay, hey, Nomad's never going to do that. And when I'm an NCO and I'm crusty and old, I'm going to correct the behavior. Well, and you just talking about with me, you know, with me right now, it's just like, wow, I'm ashamed. <laughs> 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 like, why are you, why are you stupid? But yeah. You know, and that's the thing. If we can impart any amount of knowledge, because, you know, I think I was talking with you about this, you know, earlier, if you're, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're, you know, on all the Instagram pages, if you're learning about all these tasks and if you're, you know, learning all these things, you know, you don't have the cop out of, you know, pleading ignorance. Right. So yeah, if, no. you know, if at any point you have, you know, someone needs to step up in your community, it's going to be you. You have a duty knowing this stuff and training this stuff that you can't say, Oh, I didn't know, or I'm not, you know, it's you. So, yeah, you know, especially being able to impart good knowledge, you know, good values, good, you know, SOPs, it, it, it's invaluable. So, or yeah, go, go for it, man. And then, and then especially like outside of the uniform, because again, like we're using examples of the uniform and, and, I, and like I'm well aware that people who listen to your show and ours either were in the army, are in the army, want to be in the army, whatever. Right. But even outside of the military, um, just like enforcing the best practice makes sense. And again, to on the army, I don't know why they don't take best practices from other units or other militaries to be like, we're going to do a better standard. And again, in my later unit with the smaller detachment, we did that. We we literally figured out what the best practice was, and that's our SOP. And it wasn't even my debt. It was the platoon SOP. Awesome. I'm like, that makes the most sense. So, like, why would people not listen to this and do this for their community now outside of uniform? Right. Well, like what you said about the uh, the British dude with the drop-in method yeah. for the ruck. I mean, makes the ruck. Yeah, perfect it, sense. And he makes perfect it. sense, dude. And as soon as he told us, and this guy was like, well, obviously he had super, you know, valid experience, but like by rank term for people who are, are only care about his rank, he was an E3 and he literally looked at like the E7 and E8 and he's like, you guys are fucking retarded. We're not doing that. And and they're like, wow, he's right. We're listening to him. Awesome. And it was a thing now. Awesome. We all did the drop in method. I'm like, it became SOP. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, what do you have tips as far as maintenance for you know for your rucksack I, I guess any equipment really but um you know we're talking about rucksacks today something that i used to do you know and what i still do is i have a little yeah. maintenance kit that i you know keep in whatever you know whatever kit whatever you know salt packer ruck that i have it has uh you know has a sewing kit it has adhesive pass or adhesive patches it has a uh, little bic lighter for loose strands has commonly used buckles that sort of thing oh and there it is nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so as you're talking about yours i'll open up mine i carry it as well and i even wrote on it because i'm ocd uh 
Nice field, field repair. repair. Awesome. Yeah, so I have all the same stuff you mentioned, but the same dude who showed me the rucksack trick, who will remain unnamed, he said carry Shugu in there. Okay. So you can fix any holes in your rucksack or your clothing. Cool. And it's literally super tiny, and you can see it doesn't yeah. like it fits. No space. That's crazy. Yeah, so um, I carry one of these just like you do. I carry it. So if it's in a rucksack... Um, I actually carry two because I'm like super double redundancy. I have a bigger one, but I carry it in the top lid of my ruck okay. so I can reach it accessible, whatever. Yeah. And then in my assault pack, it's on the outside pocket. That's just kind of where I carry it. Um, and then, yeah, for a good field repair kit for, yeah, for repairing your ruck, um, the biggest thing is, um, you know, preparing before you need to repair it. So like I said, I would check everything before an exercise, after an exercise, before use, after use, whatever the application is. I check it all, um, replace whatever has to be replaced. The biggest thing too, man, with again, the Cordura bags, I burn a ton of threads. Anytime there's a thread, I burn it yep. because I don't want it to rip or, you know, get worse. Again, the Shugu, if there is something ripping that I don't want to resew, I could just Shugu where the tear is and then the Shugu hardens and it's good to go. Um, in mine, I don't have it out now because I was I was actually oh no I do have a couple left but I, I was actually doing field repair the other day before we did this not to plan it but I was fixing my own stuff. Um, I replaced whatever crappy um, needles with like kind of the more curved ones. Cool. Yeah. So they're easier to sew by hand, right? I also replaced the crappiest um, thread with the thickest thread that I could put through Cordura. So it's heavier duty nice. when I'm repairing whatever I'm repairing. I also carry a small multi-tool in there. Yeah. Because it has scissors to cut the thread and it's got needle nose pliers. And obviously I have a multi-tool in my kit, but I don't have to dig out my other multi-tool because this one has it and then I can repair my kit or whatever. That's redundancy. Yeah. And it doesn't weigh anything. Like the thing's like, what, two inches? Not even. Super small. Um, I also carry extra Velcro. Nice. Do you, um, yeah, I have quite a bit actually. Do you carry Velcro in yours as well or no? I don't. No. So I do. I don't need it for now because I'm not in uniform, but we did if I had to have IFF markers on my rock. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I could replace it. That makes yeah, sense. That's why I carried Velcro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it was, and again, it was just the... Um, I, always, I always forget the Velcro side. What is it? Like the actual side, the opposite side of what a patch would be. So like, you know what I'm talking about? There's like the hard or the soft. Yeah, right. Yeah. The hook or the Yeah, loop. the actual thing that... Yeah. Yeah, the hook and loop. Yeah, the... Whatever the, I guess it would be the loop. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, the hook's on the patch, right. right? Yeah. Yeah, so I just carry the loop. I don't carry hook in okay. my kit. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then Shugu. And then I carry it in a soap dish. That's what I'm using. Okay, cool. Yeah. What do you carry yours in? I just had a, uh, you know, from the 20 different packs I bought when I, you know, E1 to E3. I had, yeah. like, a little, um, it was, like, a little 511 or a little uh, Black Hawk. Uh, like four inch by four inch, just square pouch. Okay. That didn't amount to anything. I never used it. So I ripped all of the, <laughs> uh, I ripped the attachment off the back and then I ripped off the uh, Molly on the front. And so it's just a oh, nice. you know, tight little package, you know, has a zip all the way across yeah. and, you know, just throw it in there. I know what it is because it's the only one that's like, because I'm not an idiot anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I've just, I carried it in a soap dish forever, literally like as an E1, I carried it and then. I just, yeah, because it's kind of overfilling. I put retainer bands and then that's it. Yeah. When I was in, I used to carry my cards in a soap dish. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And that's kind of what I use as like my, uh, you know, repair kit. And yeah, again, it's like, cause I can patch, I can sew. Um, I don't carry the waterproof spray though, that you're talking about. Like I'll do that at home. Before, yeah. Yeah. That's why I do too. After. Yeah. But I don't carry it on me. Right. Again, I don't think that's worth the wait. Mm -hmm. Right. Or some people would argue um i could see doing I like don't a have... like a bar of wax i could see that yes i wouldn't do the yes. spray that's make you know just doesn't make no. any sense at all no um i did used to carry i don't anymore and um again it's a double redundancy thing but i don't carry those patch repair kits that are specifically made for the cordura i just used tape but like 100 mile an hour tape okay and i would put two sides i would just put like one side on each hole yep. and then kind of cover it mm -hmm. because again like what you said earlier your triple redundancy or your triple purpose of your gear, the tape I can use for other things, but that adhesive patch, you can't even use that as tape. Right. Like it doesn't work. Yeah. It's not so good. I just never carried it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just used tape. 
Yeah, I have a lot for of my actual like, I love a du- water or for fixing. Yeah, yeah, I have a little roll of duct tape that um that I actually took off and re rolled you know off of the off of the donut, so I have more in a tighter package. Um, so we used to carry half a roll of like duct tape or hundred mile an hour tape wrapped around the bottom of one of our algaes. That's smart. Yeah, we all did that. That's smart. <laughs> So then I, and, and it was, it was kept in my second line. Cause I'm always going to water with me. Well, I've seen a lot of guys do it with their Bic lighters too. Those tape around. Yes. The Bic so I actually have that on all my Bic lighters and, um, I carry chapstick upside down taped to a Bic lighter. We can, again, cold weather environment, or even in the field when you're nasty, you're always like, gonna need chap yeah. Lips. yeah, you're always going to need either. And you can actually use the chapstick as a fire starter. If you had to, you could light it little trick. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I taped them together. Same thing. I have the tape, but I carried half a roll of tape taped to the bottom of my Nalgene. Um, yeah. And my kit. So I always had tape because yeah, you'd see guys who have like a whole roll of duct tape and some, you know, NCOs like that guy switched on. I'm like, yeah, I get carrying tape, but I'm not carrying a whole roll of it. Yeah. That's super heavy. That's stupid. All right. Well, it's like what you were, God, I don't remember what episode it was, but you were talking about, uh, what would be the point of carrying 550 cord when you have that braided line? Oh, the bank line. Yeah. yeah. The bank line. Yeah. 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 So, so that's, yeah, that's what we did. And again, it, this wasn't me, someone I knew at some points, like we're going to put tape on our water bottle. And I'm like, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And we only did it on one because again, like not to like beat it at horse. And I'm sure people can figure out why you would only do it on one, but the other bottle is where my nesting cup was and you can't put tape on the bottom of it. Cause then it doesn't fit in the nesting cup. Right. So I put it on the one that didn't have the nesting cup. Right. Yeah. So then I knew, and, and even at night when I'd feel in my belt kit or my whatever vest I'm wearing, I knew what bottle had the tape from when I grabbed it. I could feel it Okay. without nods. I'm like, Hey, this is where my tape is it's yeah. on this bottle. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Also, um, not for the purpose you're talking about, but being able to differentiate your, uh, your canteens would be good if you were, you know, using like chemical filtration, you know, having like yes. clean versus dirty catch or whatever yes. else. Yeah. And then I think we talked about this offline and like, it's not super related to rucks, but like just while we're talking about the canteen thing, we used to tape Ziploc bags to the outside of all of our analgenes and inside the Ziploc bag, we had all our water tabs. Cool. Cause I hated seeing guys have water tabs in like a pouch in their vest. Mm-hmm. We just taped it to the bottle. Yeah, it's smart. So then you then you can open the Ziploc and get the tab out. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just what we Dude, do. I love Aqua tabs. Like just they're awesome. Price per you know per yeah. point on the, you know they don't weigh anything. They don't take any nope. space, and you know they work. And you and, and you just throw it in and forget it. Yeah. You just leave it there while you're doing other things. One tab, one quart, half an hour, you're done. And yeah. that you're done. You know pretty much anything on the continent you're good to go if not you're good to you know, go have a have a filter if you do both yeah i mean you're you're set yeah we we usually did that too again depending on the environment like uh i did i've done a lot of stuff in the actual mountains and we had a water filter between again the four of us we carried one of the plat it was the platypus because i don't know our our unit issued platypus as a brand like i'm not you know saying it's better or worse it's just that's what we used but we had one of their um gravity bag system and again there's four of us so we one guy carried the clean bag one guy carried the dirty and we marked it with tape yeah the dirty bag had a big piece of tape across the top so you could feel it at night yeah smart yeah. so we knew like that's the dirty bag yeah and then we just did that and then yeah we would filter water and then tab it if we had to but good what other um not pro tips but what are um, some things that you've seen people forget or not think about, like what would be your, um, you know, say your two or three items that you know, you see people most forget or most neglect in either packing their rucksack ruck or, yeah. or just their equipment in general. Um, personal hygiene. So again, um, doesn't matter if the application, hunting, hiking, military, whatever. Um, you need to keep yourself clean, like, you know, and you're not going to last. And like, I'm sure you will agree with this when I say it, brushing your teeth in the patrol base literally increases morale by 400 points. I feel so good brushing my teeth. When you can take a cheap, a Walmart, you know, uh, travel toothbrush is what we use or just cut down a toothbrush. They, a normal one brush. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the thing that we all did again, it was like just SOP. We all taped 
um, the travel toothbrush upside down with a travel toothpaste tube taped together. So you could pull out the travel toothbrush and then like have it out of its carrier, put the toothpaste on, brush your teeth and then whatever. But it was taped in a package, super small. Cool. Um, yeah, and a bar of soap too. People don't bring that in the field. People are obsessed with baby wipes and I'm not opposed to that because I do carry baby wipes as well. But a bar of soap, if you can shower or even bird bath, you know what I mean? Or like you come across a stream or something, yeah. that is way better than the amount, like a hundred, you know, pounds of friggin' baby wipes. Well, and they only go so far, you know, baby wipes also freeze. They, they do. In the freeze. Cold. They do freeze. And they, they so. only go so far because <laughs> to a point you're only pushing around the bacteria or whatever yes. else is in there. Whatever and else. Then, yes. So you have to think, so things that are naturally growing on your skin staff. Yeah. All right. Yes. And if you're pushing that into wounds or whatever else, you, you know, and, and you know, there you go. Wound care, right? You know, what, yeah. what you can do so much more with a clean canteen cup and some soap than you can with, yeah. you know, a hundred, you know, pack of baby wipes. So, yeah. And like, I still carry baby wipes and, and I did throw my entire military career, but I called them wipes because I only used it to wipe. I didn't use it to clean my body. I used a bar of soap. Yeah. I was that guy who would boil water because I'm going to eat anyway. So I'm like, well, boil more water and I'll wash myself. Yeah. But and yeah, I, th- the morale I think huge. hygiene is a thing. Yeah, exactly. And like, like the man, the morale of like cleaning yourself in a patrol base at two in the morning is like, it's unreal. It's unreal. Yeah. Whereas guys just get lazy and they're like, well, I'm already carrying all this crap. I don't need a bar of soap. But like, like, well, just like we said, like my repair kit here, I literally had the same soap dish, dude, but it had soap in it. Yeah. And they were side by side in my top lid. And I had toothbrush and toothpaste. And again, I think personal hygiene is something that's very overlooked when it comes to mm-hmm. rucking or patrolling or whatever you want to call it. You know, like the whole everyone's obsessed with recce stuff. I'm like, yeah, even in that small team, man, we all carried our own soap dish and toothbrush and toothpaste. We all did. Yeah. Just the thing we did. My thing besides, you know, hygiene, which is, of, of course, super important, but um, just body care, self-care yeah. type items. So you mentioned chapstick. So yep. chapstick, lotion, and then also, um, I don't know what it's called. Foot powder. Oh, uh, We carried a lot of foot powder. Yeah, I, we did. I would never leave without foot powder, but yeah, yeah foot powder. Yeah, foot powder. Dude, I came this close to trench foot. <laughs> In Afghanistan, <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> oh, mm, horrible. But, um, and then I guess you can count it under lotion, but it's called, um, working hands. My hands in winter, oh, and cold, yes, they, yes. they yeah, split. I've, I've used that. They split, they split. They bleed, yes, and they split down to the nail. Like, my hands yeah. are super bad for that, so I have to stay on top of it because you're just inviting yeah. infection, and then I can't do anything with my fingers. If yeah. any pressure gets on, it's like 10 out of 10 pain, it's horrible. So I have to stay on top of that. But um, those kind of items are huge. And then moleskin, just for your feet. You know, taking oh, care of your man. feet. If you can't walk. I carry so much moleskin. Yeah, I have a, an entire thing of moleskin. And like, uh, again, it was, what's his name? Grand Thumb calls it the boo-boo pouch. And everyone like hated on him for it. I'm like, well, no, it makes yeah. sense. It's not an eye fact. It's just like your niceties. And I like, I carry a boo-boo pouch in my ruck. And I have one in my belt kit as well. But um, yeah. The one of my belt kit's very small, but the one of my ruck is much larger. But um, yeah, I have a h- extensive foot care package. And again, it's not for me because I take care of my body and my feet. It's usually for someone else. Yeah. But I carry one. Booboo kits are huge, man. They're huge. Yeah. I, mean, I also carry needles in the foot kit. Did you guys carry that? Uh, I never did. Do you know I know, what where, I, know I know where you're getting at. Yeah. It's smart. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So from a medical standpoint, do you agree on it? I'm not talking about cutting the blister. We would drain it and then clean it. So there's different... Yeah, I mean, there's different camps, of course, like with anything. Yeah. You know, if you do, if you're clean and you're able to keep it clean, I don't see any problem with yes. it. Yes. You know, the yeah. the problem comes if you're not clean to begin with and if you're not able to keep it clean after it's done. Yes. Because then you're inviting infection. That's not good. Um, yeah. If at all possible, depending on the size of the blister, I like to keep the, you know, I like to leave it alone just because yeah. I can, if I can manage it on its own with like moleskin or, you know, whatever yeah. other covering, if I don't have to worry about it, then I try not to because... In my experience, when the skin breaks on its own, it's already had that time to heal. Where yeah. as long as it needs to, and that's less of a worry for me. But you know, you've I've seen some blisters where it covers the dude's entire, you know, the entire foot, middle of his entire foot, heel. and it's like, yeah, exactly. No, you're not going to walk around on that. So, I mean, yeah, I'll, you know, 
And that's the thing, right? SOPs are written in blood. Everything that you've heard or everything that someone set up has been there for a reason. It's just yeah. filtering out, you know, the good reasons and bad reasons. The good reasons. Yeah, yeah. that makes total sense. But, the other thing we would the other thing we would do for the foot care, um, if we knew we were going to do a long movement because we carried tape, we would change out our socks like super fresh before we do the long movement and we would put tape across the whole bottom of our foot. Interesting. Okay. So the rubbing between your sock is between the tape and the sock, not your foot. Okay. I could see that. Yeah, for sure. And I've never gone a blister doing it that way. And I'm not going to do that for like 10 days or even three days, mm-hmm. but I'll do it for a super long infill. Yeah. And then take the tape off. I could see, I could see that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like I used to always, um, God, what was it called? Well, no, towards the end, I just used Vaseline on the inside of my thighs. Oh, yeah, 100%, because they're rubbing all the time with your stupid combat pants, yeah. And, yep. like, you're trying to walk in, it's mad chafe, yeah. Yeah, I do it all the time. Guys would be crying behind me in front of me. I just, you know, whatever. Yeah. Off you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely one of those things, though. Yeah, like the boo-boo kit or maintenance um, or personal hygiene. It's, yeah, something people, again, like we said, we're talking about rucks, and you can maintain your equipment all day, but if you, like, neglect your body, man, you're you're not going to last. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know why it's a thing people do in uh, – um yeah people again they try and solve it with equipment they're like well I'll just bring more clothing um actually yeah i wanted to ask you that because again it's on the lines of rocks what what did you guys do like as an sop or you now because like you've said it multiple times is you care a lot more now because you don't have something yeah you know yelling at you to care mm-hmm. how like how much spare clothing or socks would you guys carry oh man so i would always bring at least one set of undergarments per day that i'd be out plus okay. extra so especially okay. socks i never messed around with socks i'd always have more than i needed but just because like i literally had a long movement one day through you know through a river through a rice paddy you know out mm-hmm. you know patrol to town went back into that yep. rice paddy at the end of the day after my feet had dried you know flew yeah back, got soaked again yeah yeah got back to the barracks took on my boots and my feet were white oh man. i had the ridges going up into my foot so yeah, no, I don't play. I don't play with feet. <laughs> so extra socks, I'd pack two a day, uh, just as a, a as a baseline. Yeah, as a base, that does make sense, and I I totally can see that. Yeah, we carried or not like as an SOP, but I only carried one a day. But we did. Uh, we talked about it before offline. I think you and I, and I, I can mention again the wet and dry routine for our clothing yeah. and our rucks. Yeah, yeah. So that's how that's how we did it, and like again, that's a way to alleviate carrying excess. Do you want to describe that for people? Yeah. So, um, again, not from me. I didn't invent this. Is uh, I've I've YouTube this to confirm the source. All the British people listening, it's it's you guys. You guys came up with this wet and dry routine clothing system where the principle is that you only wear one set of uh, like or like a uniform or your clothing attire um, that's wet all day. Doesn't matter how many patrols you do. At like fourteen days in a row, doesn't matter. You're always wearing the same wet ones, and then you have a dry set that you sleep in or when you're in your patrol base and you're doing patrol base routine, you're kind of wearing that one minus like security or clearance patrols. Like I would stay in the wet ones, but if you're still, if you're chilling by your actual fighting position, I would switch into my dry ones. Again, it's a hygiene thing, but we did that. We found that was beneficial again in a very small, you know, team environment because I'm carrying more team gear than personal gear. I can't have the luxury of carrying a change of clothing every day, even under clothing. So the t-shirt as an example, t-shirt or underwear so what i found worked for me even uh i'm talking like days like close to weeks at a time being like out there and only getting resupplied on water food and ammo um i found i'd only bring two full sets of t-shirts and like underwear in case i like my brains out but i only had the one as a backup i would not touch on my rock it was literally there in case something happened and the other one i was just doing the wet dry routine and if your stuff is so destroyed from the day from doing stuff that again the bar of soap thing i would wash it and let it quasi dry at night and then i'm putting it on in the morning and it's kind of wet but my body will dry it and now the garment's been cleaned so i'm carrying way less clothing than your typical guy would tell you to carry okay but again i learned that through experience because i'm like i'm not carrying three bare uniforms i'm like i'm gonna carry one and i'm literally gonna sleep in it right and i'm gonna wear the trashed one all day and then i'll clean it and the sock thing i totally get it because like i've never had trench foot i've never been close to it but i understand that but the same thing with the sock um the wet dry routine how we did it unless your socks were totally soaked 
I would take off the wet socks during the day that I wore. And when I'd sleep at night, finally in my sleeping bag, I'd put them against my chest underneath my clothing. So my body would kind of dry them. And I would sleep in clean, dry socks or no socks at all. Let my feet completely air out like baby powder. I'm just let them chill. And then depending on how wet they are, I would either change socks if I had to or put the semi-dry ones on now. And if they were really soaked, we'd hang them off our rucksack underneath our lid so they could kind of dry while we patrolled. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what I do now is if I have yeah, yeah socks that we need did drying, that. I would just, I'll just hang off my kit. Let me air Yeah, dry. And, and like we just did that, man, because honestly, like I said, I was, I was a new guy too. And it was very easy to be like, I'm carrying three combats because my sergeant told me to. I'm like, yeah, but now I have to carry all this platoon. Right. And I'm carrying so much clothing or I, I even remember being that dude. I had like 10 t-shirts, man, on a like 18 day exercise. Why did I need 10 t-shirts? Right. I could probably get by with three. Yeah. If you proper or sorry, if you practice proper like, you know, routine of wet and dry routine. And again, the Brits have been doing this forever and I'm sure I'm not describing it as well as these guys can, but that's just how we did it. And it made the most sense because now you're yeah. carrying less clothing. Yeah. In your gear. Well, and the hygiene thing is, is huge, right? So not sleeping in, you know, wet soul clothing. Yeah. At night. Wet clothing. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And especially if you take the time to clean yourself and again, all like, we'll stick it to the, the, the patrol base, like the military context, whenever, you know, you're going through patrol base routine and the last thing after like, you know, security, your comms, your weapons cleaning, all that dog. The very last thing you get is rest. I was that dude, man. I would not just go to my bag and sleep. I would like boil water, wash my face, put fresh campaign on if I had to. If they're like, you got to put campaign on. I'm like, okay, well, I'm washing my face. I'm putting campaign on. While I'm boiling the water, I'm brushing my teeth and I'm going to eat my food. And then I'm changing into my dry clothing. And I'm and yeah, I may get 40 minutes of sleep versus the two hours. But my my gear has been serviced. I'm going to like I, at this point, I'm going to outlast someone. Well, eventually. And, well, and there's something to be said about um, the quality of rest that you're receiving versus, yes. you know, if you get longer rest, that's, you know, not as broken. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's broken or isn't as uh, fulfilling, isn't as, you know, as high quality as, you know, after you've gone through that, you know, nightly routine, that routine specifically, you know, yeah. that's really important, but also, um, you know, the comfort level, right. That's huge. Yeah. And, and again, it was something I learned very early on and I'm like, okay, I think the, I think just speaking from like the hygiene perspective in regards to rucking or patrolling, I'm like, it's something that's overlooked because people just want to sleep. Mm -hmm. They're lazy. They're like, I need sleep. Yeah. But again, I'm like anyone who's patrolled for longer than three days and done like weeks at a time with only can resupply, you know, beans bullets and you know water yeah. like you probably i'm not gonna ask the rear echelon for a spare combat top i don't need it if i can like keep my shit clean yeah it's just yeah something that i learned over time and then again i can keep my base weight i guess we didn't even mention that so base weight for a ruck in the rucking world is minus water or food so it's just like your bare minimum you're not including water or food okay. i can keep a base weight man of a ruck of sub 30 pounds like easily goodness because I carry way less. Yeah. Clothing specifically. I'm like, I'll carry less, right? Because yeah. I know. I'm like, I have good routine. Or I'll carry one item that can do three things, like what you said. Right. Right. For even clothing related. Well, and keeping that weight down, right? You talked about, you know, going farther, going, you know, longer than other dudes. I mean, yeah. that's that's invaluable being able to do that. Yeah. Because, like I said, if you can lighten up your load or spread the load between, like we said earlier, um, first line, second line, third line. I'm like, that makes sense. Cause even for me, like again, with the belt kit thing, I carried a full meal and socks in my belt kit, like one full meal, like either an MRE, like when you're, or we call them IMPs cause of the Canadian ration, but, or like a dehydrated meal. I'd carry one full one in my belt kit and spare socks and one small stove, you know, like whatever. Because again, I'm like, okay, well, that's like an emergency. Because again, I'm not going to eat from the belt kit. I'm going to eat from my ruck. Right. I'm just using right. that like to spread the weight. Yeah. Or as an emergency, if you have to ditch your ruck or ditch your assault pack or whatever the scenario may be. Yeah, for sure. So what would be your, I'd say your one major takeaway for someone looking to get get set up in, you know, with their ruck, you know, to you know, to operate out, to live out of, you know, not for a yeah. period of time, but just something, you know, the, a foundational, uh, a foundational takeaway. 
something to get guys off on the right foot. Yeah. I think it would honestly do just be the first point I said on like, what's your application? Like, what are you using the rucksack for? Because like I said, so many people are pushing gear or brands. I'm like, but you don't need it for that application. And then from there, like we said, we can go through like, okay, what size of ruck? Is it internal? Is it external? Do I need outer pouches? You know, like, am I carrying team stuff? Like, like all these questions will get answered when you, your first question should be, what's its intended use? What, what am I, you know, doing it for? And then again, anyone who, again, for the, you know, for the hard, strong men outside of uniform and you have like a family to take care of or a tribe or a people you regularly hike with, you probably need to carry extra stuff for them. And I'm not saying you should, but like to have the ability to, if you need so, because like you said earlier, it's your job. Like you can't look to the left or right. It's like people are looking at you. Yeah. So you should probably have extra stuff or know what to do for the people who don't have extra stuff. And like you and uh, you and six mentioned it on the last podcast, we were all together. You guys said like, you guys did a hike together with a bunch of other people and no one had enough water and you had two courts you were handing out to people. Yeah. Because you knew. And like, right. and like these guys looked at you as default. They're like, oh, like seven's going to save me. You're like, okay, I guess I am today. Yep. I guess I'm giving you water. Right. Yeah. So I think like just looking at the application makes a lot of sense. And before they even decide, you know, new, used, volume, whatever. Awesome. Yeah. And I would say, you know, something that I've really loved, you know, following you guys on your, on your uh, Instagrams is you guys take the extra time, you know, wherever you can find it to go out and you know put these skills put these uh put this training into practice right so you know stack you work shift work you know you got you know school and work going on and you guys still find time to go out for you know after work a couple days go out for a couple days and you know put the stuff into practice so you know i say find the time find the time you know whatever ruck you have doesn't matter what ruck you have doesn't matter you know what your what your application is you know, go out and put hours, put miles down with that ruck because, you know, only you, only you are going to be able to find what works or what doesn't work for you, you know, because mm-hmm. we can give you all the best practices that we can have, the best out of space practice that we can, but it might not work for you. It might not work for your context or you can find something that works better, you know, but you won't know until you do it. Did you guys ever do bug out exercises in the army? Like you would get a phone call at like one in the morning and have to be at work in like a couple hours. And then you would like, like actually quote unquote deploy on an exercise. Did you guys ever do that? No, we did that when people, you know, drank and drive, but never for fun. So we, we did it quote unquote for fun on a pretty annual or semi-annual basis. It was like okay. a pretty regular thing. We would get a phone call and, um, I was going to say normal people can do that. Then like static, I'll reference him again. He did that a couple of weeks ago because he worked shift work and everyone knows he's a cop still. He got home from shift and gave himself like a 15 minute window. He packed a bunch of random 10 items or not random, but like whatever he could think of into a rucksack and he bugged himself out and went out for a night. And then he got up early and drove to work, showered at the department and went on shift. What a monster. So I'm like, you could do that and bug yourself out, like you said, if you find the time. And then that is the best way to test your ruck versus I've tried it on 30 times in my apartment and I'm looking at YouTube videos or I'm listening to, you know, these two guys on a podcast. I'm like, well, you could just put all your shit in a bag and go, yeah, go for a ruck. And then not even just not even do the movement, sit out there and like, okay, I'm going to boil water. I'm going to build a shelter. Yeah. Or sit on the side of the road. Yeah. Sit on the side of the road and then, you know, try, layer up and hang out. Try to like, stay on knee for 10 minutes. Yeah, right? Exactly. Or, the, or and like, this is going to sound so redundant, but like practice donning and duffing the, or do, do, donning and doffing the way we explained it. Yeah. It may not be cool or sexy training. I'm like, yeah, but if you get reps in now, you'll do it when you're tired and you're hungry. Or walk for a mile and then try to find something in your ruck. Yeah. Turn the lights off you in your apartment or your house and try to find something in your ruck without lights. I mean. Without nods. Yeah, without nods. <laughs> without nods. <laughs> yeah, like try, try and find something in your ruck. Yeah, right. But but like the, yeah, man. Like these are all things that like don't cost you money. They cost you time. Yeah. So at the end of the day, like, is it worth it to you? Well, well, it is to me. It is to like my family in my house. I'm like, yeah, I know where everything is in my bag. I know where everything is in the bags of the people in my house. I know it better than the people who are carrying the bags. Yeah. I can tell you where their stuff is because I like took the time to go through it with them. Well, the thing is, if you ever have to use it. It's going to be worth it then. It's going to be worth it then. Yeah. 
Exactly. And then same thing, right? Full circle, going back to my experience in a small unit capacity. And like, we knew where everybody's was in their bag. Yeah. It's just, we, we knew where it was. Yeah. SOPs are so important. They're huge. Yeah. Yeah. And like, these are things that like, like you said earlier, you can develop for your own group, your own, your own people. Like, you know, you're not following a military like group, or if you're in the military, change it. Be that man who changes the standard. Yeah. Be that guy in your platoon who's like, hey, I got an idea. I heard these two kind of wacky dudes talking about rucksacks. We're going to try a few things. Yeah. Like you can be, like you can be the change. Well, right. And, you know, just because something's been done for years doesn't mean that it's the best. Because it's always been like that. That right. Because that was the line we said like last that. time. Yeah. It's always been like that. Yeah. No. So, yeah, dude. Yeah. People have the time and just the effort. I think like, yeah, like rucking's a good way to start in the prepared mindset. Cause like you said, you need it no matter the application, you need a bag. Yeah. Well, it makes me think of our last episode, you know, you talking about field craft, you know, it is, yeah, it, it is it's applicable baseline. to everything. Yeah. The baseline. Yeah. But people just don't want to hear it or it's, it's work. Like what we said, static went out after like, and I joked with him after when he, he texted me the next morning and I said like, dude, like the last thing any normal person wants to do after shift is go home, not shower and grab a rock and go to the bush when it's dark. But he did it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and it just shows his commitment to it. Yeah. hundred cool. percent. Well, no, man, thanks for coming on, man. You know, thanks it's again, always dude. a pleasure it. and, you know, had a lot of fun this time. I think we got a lot of really great information in there. So you want to plug your, plug your podcast website, everything else. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. Anyone listening, um, you can find us on our own podcast, that first response Fieldcraft podcast. We're still only on Spotify and Google. I'm trying to screw around with Apple. It's a pain. Uh, hopefully, Seven's actually going to help me get it on multiple platforms in the future. That's something on my list to do. And then, yeah, um, our podcast has an Instagram, First Response Fieldcraft, and then mine's Nomadic Fieldcraft. Assets, Nike. not liabilities. Not liabilities. <laughs> cool. Well, we are the hard time strong men here to train up a bear class of man. Thanks for listening and stay in the fight. Yeah.